it morning, good afternoon, or good night, depending on what part of the world you're visiting us. Hi, my name is Daniel Marcos, the host of the podcast Impact X, how the best CEOs uh, could have 10 times the impact with half the drama. And today I am with Cameron Herald. He, he's known as the CEO Whisperer. Um, he's the CEO of, and the COO Alliance. It's an amazing, amazing organization that helps COOs become great in their companies and really be able to support the CEO. And talking about having more impact, it's critical you have an amazing head of operations in your company. And of course, the best one uh, for this is Cameron, and that's what we're going to talk about. How can you really uh, have that support and build that team that really help you scale your company? And also, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, PR. He has an amazing book called Free PR. I was talking with him about this uh, before the, the interview. We use it at Growth Institute all the time. It's an amazing tool. Um, so, hey, Cameron, how are you? Good, Daniel. Good to see you again. Good to see you again. Uh, we saw each other in Phoenix like three weeks ago, a month ago, uh, Joe's event. Yeah, that's right. It was great to see you there. You as well. And I heard you're in uh, Israel now. I am, yeah. My wife and I had uh, sold everything about a year and a half ago, and we now travel full time and work from the road. So we're over in Israel for the month. It's amazing. Really cool. Hey, how do you do your business? You have a pretty decent sized business that you help CEOs all over the world. How do you mm -hmm. run your business from all over the world? You don't have to see them. Do you have live events with them? Yeah, I have. Um, so the COO Alliance, we have 12 monthly events that are all online. So we've got 170 plus members from 17 countries, and we all meet three hours a month online. And then we have two events in person every year. And I just fly back to North America for that. And you'll like this story. Next September, I'm hosting our COO Alliance event at the MIT uh, Endicott House in Boston, where we've always held the EMP program. That's so awesome. I'm hosting... Yeah, I'm hosting a COO Alliance event there and we'll have, hopefully we'll fill up all of Endicott and hopefully we fill up all of Brooks Hall as well. So That's really cool. I'm, I'm going back this year for the 19th year uh, for Garden of Titans, <laughs> as you know, uh, and I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm the chair of this year. So so super, oh, super nice. excited to be there again. It, yeah, it's a magical place. I love Endicott as well. Yeah, it's it a is. magical place. Is Phil, is, is Phil Pender still there every year? Yeah. <laughs> yes. That's great. So we, we love Titans. We 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 met at Burning of Giants for three years, and then we've done sixteen years uh, meeting back mm -hmm. into the into same place, Endicott, same place. It's just I just think it's magical. Yeah, it's great. So so let's talk about head of operations. Um, mm -hmm. Like, if you really want to be a great CEO, you have to build an amazing team, and everything starts with head of operations. So so tell us what's the main role of head of operations? How do you get the right head of operations, and how do you really work correctly with them? Uh, so they could really help you build an amazing team. Yeah, I'm glad you started with this because it's actually, so I have a book coming out um, called The Second in Command, and it's how to leverage the power of a COO. And what we really understand is that every COO is as different as the entrepreneur that they work with. So if you think about all of the members of Gathering of Titans, you know, there's 65 of you as members, every single one of you are completely different. You know, you've got Rick Sapio and you and Chris Kaplan and, you know, well, all of you are completely different as entrepreneurs. So your second in command has to be as different. Your COO, as an example, has to be really good at all the stuff that you are not good at. And they have to love working on the areas that you don't like working on. So if you're a very tech focused COO or CEO, which you are, you're probably very tech savvy. Um, you might want a COO who doesn't want to get involved in the engineering and tech side of the business. But let's say that you're a COO that is more marketing and sales and people, you might want a very tech engineering focused COO who can help leverage that side of the business for you. So the first thing you're looking for is someone who's great at the stuff you suck at. Second thing you're looking for is a real implicit trust, a really great, strong relationship between the two of you. And then third is someone who has all of the traits that you need to actually scale out the organization and the skill set um, that you're looking for. So it's a, it's a more of a complicated answer. Okay. Um, a lot of people are calling the, the two in a box, the two CEOs and one in charge mm -hmm. of the inside, one of the outside. And then some talk about uh, CEO, some talk about an integrator. Vern talks right. about an orchestrator. Like, like what, what's the right rule or, 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 or um, is there like a one thing fits all or, or you really have to build it based on the strengths and weakness of the CEO? 
Yeah, you're building on the strengths and weaknesses. So the visionary integrator title really came out of traction with Gina Wickman's idea. I almost called my book the second in command. I almost called it two in a box, but I didn't have enough people that understood the concept as well. So, so I'm talking about the yin and yang relationship between the two. But I think all of the people understand that the power of two people that are really strongly connected, like that true yin and yang relationship can get a lot more done. It's almost like, you know, a single parent trying to raise their children versus two parents, you know, trying to raise, you know, when you have two people trying to raise the family, you can get a lot more done. You can divide and conquer. One can take care of the house. One can take care of the kids or one can take the kid to one activity. The other can take, you know, you get more done with two people. And if the trust is really strong between the two, that's where the real power comes from. That's awesome. Um, when, when you hire someone and you, they complement each other, what are the mm -hmm. rules of engagement uh, for your relationship to work with your CEO correctly? Yeah, I, I even talk about that in the book, The Second in Command, that it's important to have almost like a date night, like you would have in a, in a traditional marriage where, you know, the husband and wife spend time together away from the kids and away from the home and just having fun together. So it's important that the CEO and COO have time away from the office on a regular weekly or every two week basis to just disconnect and hang out and spend time together to continue to build the bonds, to continue to laugh and have a good time, to continue to get to know each other as people. When I was the COO for 1-800-GOT-JUNK for, for Brian's company, and Brian's a member of Gathering of Titans, Brian and I were best friends. Before I even started working for him, he was my best man at my wedding. And we'd been in a YEO forum together for four and a half years. He saw me grow two other companies. So he had a four and a half year interview. He could, he already saw all of my skills. So we had a lot of trust. He knew my skill set. And day one, we really could hit the ground running. So we almost had an unfair advantage. So I think it's important that you spend time together out of the office. You spend time working and building trust with each other. You really spend time getting vulnerable and connecting like they teach us in EO and YPO to really connect with each other and really, you know, understand and, and, um, and honor the other person. And then also spending time kind of recalibrating every six to 12 months to develop the proper swim lanes. You know, you might change business areas. At times, maybe it makes more sense for one person to run a business area and maybe six months or 18 months later, it makes sense for the other person to oversee it. So it's always about that recalibration. It's a little bit of a dance that you go on as the CEO and COO. That's awesome. And it's interesting that you mentioned about the hiring process. Mm -hmm. um, we, we've seen people say, hey, call me and I'll help you hire a COO. Um, at at uh, Scaling Up and Growth Institute, we believe the best way is what you guys did. Someone you already deeply know and you trust to allow them and have that relationship. So what's the best way to hire your CEO or to um, get partnered, let's say, with a CEO uh, that yeah. needs a great CEO? So it depends on the size of the company. So as your company is starting to scale, you can often take someone internally who can become kind of your MVP or your partner and continue to grow. But when the company gets to a certain size, if you don't have enough of the bench, you know, the virtual bench right. internally or enough, enough depth in your bench internally, you may have to bring in that outside expert. Or maybe you're, you're going through a very large inflection point, like taking the company public or going through an exit in the organization or doing acquisitions. And you might need some additional skill set in that CEO or that entrepreneur. Even for me, as an example, after six and a half years of being Brian's COO at 1-800-GOT-JUNK, I was the right person to go from 2 million to 106 million, but I was the wrong person to go from 106 million to the billion. So there was a time when Brian had to take me out of the organization and bring a new COO in who could then continue to scale. So it's all about the, the size of the organization, what skills are needed by that COO at that time. So it's getting the right person in the right seat at the right time. You know, the current COO who's been with Brian for nine years, I've known Eric, his COO now for 35 years. We started a fraternity together oh. in 1987. <laughs> yeah. But I was the president of the fraternity in the first year. Eric was president the second year. And then I was Brian's first COO. Eric's now the third COO, but Eric's been there for nine years. Eric would have been a horrible COO for the first six years, as I would have been horrible for the nine years he's been there. He would have been the right person at the wrong time. So it's all about finding that, that balance again. So Sometimes an executive recruiting agency is a really good tool to use to go help you find the right person and plug them in, but you have to make sure that you know everything about them before day one. 
you really have to grill them. You really have to go through the torque process. So I try to follow all the rules of top grading in Jeff Smart's book, Who, and really make sure that you build those systems so that you know everything about the candidate before you bring them in. And then you have really strong onboarding systems in place, which I talk about in the second command to make sure that you can bring the person into the organization and get them up and running as soon as possible. That's awesome. Um, when, when someone wants to really build a relationship, as you said, they have to spend an hour or some time outside of the office. Um, mm -hmm. I really believe the most critical part, the CEO and CEO, is the trust that you build with each That's other. Right. Um, mm -hmm. So you, be, you believe the best way to build that trust is having that time outside of the office uh, in a regular it's, it's, Yeah, it's having some time outside of the office. Maybe it's even engaging someone like a marriage counselor. I have a, a marriage counselor that I have work with a lot of CEOs and COOs that are within my network. So she'll actually do calls with the CEO and COO to act as a marriage counselor, to help them connect better, to help them broaden their communication and, and, and own their own shit and look in the mirror. And so often if you work with these high powered coaches, they can help you around that leadership and self-deception areas as well, right? Because often we know we can all get in our own grooves and think that we're right. I hear so often the entrepreneur thinks that they're right and the CEO is wrong. Okay. And then I hear the COO thinks they're right and the CEO is wrong. I think somewhere in between is the truth. So you can build trust and connection by getting a really strong, you know, marriage counselor to work with you as well. I have a great one, Dr. Patty Ann, who works with, you know, all of these different couples, but that can be helpful doing relationship or, or trust deepening exercises like we do in EO and YPO forums, like doing a lifeline, you know, doing the lessons from the edge, really talking about the stuff that you've screwed up on in the past, you know, doing a lot of the communication starters, like really actually understand getting to know each other and doing some of those exercises can be powerful in building up the team. And then the next area I think is doing a few different personality profiles on each other. So you might do disc and strength finders and um, Colby and, and, and then doing it with your COO as well so that you get to understand them and they can understand you so that you can look at how do you mesh those skill sets together. It's, it's the work that most CEOs don't spend time on. You know, they hire the right person and then they say, okay, go do it. Well, that doesn't work. You know, and then you, you wake up a year later realizing that you didn't build the connection, you didn't build the trust, you probably abdicated too much responsibility, you didn't really get to connect with each other, so you just splintered off in different directions. So imagine you get in CEO Alliance a lot of CEOs that the CEO said, hey, you're wrong, you have to go and learn how to be a CEO and send to you, yeah. and then you realize that there, there's a problem communication or alignment there. So what do you recommend yeah. the CEO if they're having trouble with the CEO? We try to teach the COOs how to talk to the CEO in the way the CEO will listen. So first is making sure that the CEO understands that we're only telling them the tough stuff, the brutal facts, so that their company will continue to grow. We're telling them the things that no one else will tell them. You know, we're telling the entrepreneur, the CEO, the things that everyone else is afraid to tell them. I don't have a filter. So I always say stuff that I think everyone else is thinking, but no one has the guts to say. I try to teach the COOs to be able to do that. So, you know, Brian, as an example, I could talk to Brian. I could pull him aside and say, hey, you're acting a little too mania, you know, manic, or you're, you're coming in with too many shiny object ideas, or you can't stay focused. And then he could tell me the same things. But in front of the team, I shone the spotlight on Brian to make him iconic. And, be, you know, in front of the team, he would shine the spotlight on me. So it was always about, teaching how to, to have that really tough, brutal facts discussion, but because it's built on this trust and because you're not doing it around the board or around the leadership team, it's in a very private moment. And they understand you're telling the CEO the stuff they're screwing up so that their company will continue to grow. They often really appreciate that. It's kind of like the emperor's new suit. You know, someone needs to tell the king he's naked. Yeah. Interesting. All right. Uh, let's let's move from the CEO to the rest of the team. Uh, you sure. and I are very aligned in the only way to scale a company is really scaling the team. Yeah, two people can only get you so far. <laughs> you got to get That's the rest right. of the people growing too. <laughs> what the best way to build that team for your team to help you to build a company? Yeah, so it's interesting. I Before I built 1-800-GOT-JUNK with Brian, I was a part of an organization called College Pro Painters. And College Pro became the world's largest residential house painting company. 
So every year we had to go out and hire 800 franchisees. And then we had to train them to hire 8,000 students to paint houses. And in four months, we did 64 million in house painting. So imagine building an 8,800 person company every year. So we had to be very good at interviewing, recruiting, hiring, onboarding, and the leadership development of people so that they could go out and get a whole bunch of stuff done. So we identified 12 core skills that leaders need to be or managers need to be strong in. And it's not what we tend to train people in. You know, I'll give you an example. You think about the Growth Institute, for an example. Have all of your managers at the Growth Institute been trained on how to do a job interview? We, we train a group of them, not all of them. Right, so not all of them, and yet they all do job interviews, right? Have, have, have all of them been trained on how to run meetings? Uh, no, just the leaders, not the rest and of they, them. And they run meetings every day, they, you know, they, and they show up and attend meetings. So here we have them now, do we train them on how to do coaching? No, well, right. no, no but problem. they coach just people. Yeah. And they yeah. do we train them in delegation? No. Yeah. Do we train them in time management? No. So I could I could rattle off the 12 most important leadership skills, and almost everyone listening has never trained their managers on how to be good at those 12 things. So business is very difficult. So what, what I like do to do is about, train them. What do you believe are those 12 things that you have to train? It okay. In? I'll try to go off the top of my head, but it's mm -hmm. situational leadership, yep. coaching, yep. delegation, one-on-one okay. -on -one coaching time management, project management, email, or like email and Slack, yeah. conflict management, interviewing, effective meetings, uh, reverse engineering the vision. <laughs> uh, oh, and classroom teaching. So teaching groups of people, you know, a subject or an area. Those are the 12 skills and every manager needs those, you know, so if we train them on those skills to a level of competency, almost like a bronze, silver, or gold in a certain skill, if we can get their competency to a bronze or a silver, the organization goes faster. You know, it's not about, here's, an, here's a classic example. The early managers, the new managers solution to almost every problem is hire more people. Every time they bump into a problem, but that's never really the answer. And that's even more common outside of the US or developed countries. It's so oh, sure. expensive to hire someone in India or Bangladesh or, or Mexico Correct. that it's just throw more people. Hire 10 people, right? Do 10 yeah. more. But the opportunity is to become more efficient, to automate, to optimize, how to get more shit done with less people faster. But that doesn't tend to happen until you have a seasoned executive that knows how to say no, they know how to handle conflict, they know how to manage multiple projects. They delegate properly so they get the proper result back within the right amount of time and for the right amount of money. So if you teach your employees and your managers those core skills, so I launched a course called Invest in Your Leaders, which are the 12 core competencies that every manager needs to be strong in. My belief is that a leader's job is to grow people. If we grow their skills and we grow their confidence, that's what scales the organization. And Are too like often to... we... Uh? Sorry, no, finish. Yeah, too often we're only growing the entrepreneur and we don't grow all the managers beneath them. But if we would just grow the managers beneath them, everything gets easy. That's exactly the base uh, of why build, we build Growth Institute because as you and I know, EO, YPO, all these programs just work with the CEO and then you have to come back and retrain your team and you have to lead all the implementation. It's a mess. You can't do that. There's yes. almost there's almost no entrepreneur out there that is really good at teaching and coaching and delegation. So what they do is they come back with all these random ideas and they go and then they get frustrated that people aren't doing it. Well, yeah. But when I when I um, went to Birding of Giants and learned scaling up or Rockford Habits back then, I came back to my team, tried to implement it. It was impossible. They just <laughs> didn't get it. So I bought a plane ticket, took them all to San Antonio. We took a, a course with Vern. Uh, uh, in San Antonio, and at lunch time, the first day, I'm like, this is amazing. Why you didn't tell us before? And I was like, I've been begging you for six months. You just didn't get yeah. it. I would not explain it, explain it correctly. And that's that's where we really can grow the company. Is if we grow our people, they can grow the company. So the leader's job 
isn't to manage people and hold them accountable. It's to actually support them and grow them and align them, right? And if we can focus on growing their skills and their confidence, they can do almost anything. That's really, really good. All right. Um, so if you want to grow your company, you first have to grow your team. Having your head of operations, having this yin and yang will help you build a team better and lead that team better. Uh, yep. Having these two people. All right. Now let's go to PR. Uh, I'm okay. a huge fan <laughs> of what you did uh, in 100 Got Junk. So please, first sure. tell the story. Um, you guys, you were like nine times in Oprah or something like that? You see No, we were, on Op- we were on Oprah one time, um, but we landed 5,200 stories about the company in six and a half years. So we, you know, we, we were in the physical print edition, like the actual magazine of Fortune, Forbes, you know, American Airlines, Entrepreneur, Success Magazine. They all wrote about us. We were in the actual newspapers of the Dallas Morning News, Chicago Tribune, San Francisco Chronicle. You know, we were on Donnie Deutsch. We, look, it was very easy for us to get press because we understood how the press works. Um, I learned this back at College Pro Painters. Brian had kind of figured it out when he was still the rubbish boys. When we got together and we both understood how to get free PR, it kind of supercharged everything. And then it was just easy. But here's what's interesting. I left 1-800-GOT-JUNK in May of 2007. I had the first Facebook account in the company and people thought I was crazy. We landed the 5,200 stories in the media before social media existed. Imagine if we'd landed all that press today and could have shared all those links on social media, it would have been huge. So there's a, there's a secret with how, do you want me to talk a little bit about how to get the free press or? Please, please. I think, I, think okay. it's, I, I love your methodology. I've used it as I told you before the interview. I've used it with, yeah. a, with a team member and it's been game changer for us. Well, and I think it's also one of the courses on the Growth Institute too. I think we did a PR session. Okay, so people can 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 take that. So the idea is here. The only way that the media outlets make money is advertising. Whether you're a podcaster, a blogger, a magazine, newspaper, TV show, radio, whatever, you only make money really off advertising. The only way you get advertising is by having people consuming your content. The only way people consume your content is to have really good content but it's expensive to go out and find good content. It's expensive to find podcast guests. It's expensive to find people to write about. So you need to have people kind of dropping on your plate to make it easy for you. So every morning, every writer, every journalist, every podcaster, every magazine writer, whatever, is trying to find who to cover and what to write about or what to cover today. What I like to do is pick up the phone or drop them them a quick personal message and say, hey, do you have two minutes? I think I have a good story for you. They're going to say, what's the story? And then you tell them what the story is and how it can help their audience, their listener, their reader. That's all and it is. To, it's that simple. And But usually the, the reporter said, no, I, like you're trying to pitch me, right? How, how, do you, how do you talk to the reporter that is not a pitch and is really helping them with content? So the first is recognizing that they really do need good content. So if you're trying to help, and it's to understand their audience. So if you understand, like for me as an example, I understand your audience is entrepreneurs, typically of medium-sized companies. You don't really like the one to 10 person companies. You probably like more of the 10 to 250 person companies. So if I understand that's your audience, who can I speak to? I can give you a couple of story ideas for that audience. But if your audience is, you know, Fortune 500, you know, running companies of 5,000 to 50,000 people, I have to position my content in a very different way, right? I'm not going to talk to them about hiring a COO. They have a COO. What I might talk to them about is why their leadership development program and their leadership training programs are broken and how to put a more entrepreneurial training program into their company that can quickly scale. That might be interesting to them. So you have to understand the audience or the listener of who your writer or podcaster is talking to so that you can position or spin the story so that they understand it's going to help their audience. All right. Um, what's, what's been the, the best case study you've seen outside of One Hundred Got Junk that have used this? Um, uh, you, you've heard a cool story after you see your Yeah, one would be Kendra Scott who built you know, a, a, billion, a billion dollar brand. I trained Kendra at uh, the EMP program probably in 2007. She really took PR and really ran with PR and, and how to generate tons of press. 
Another would be Naomi Simpson from Red Balloon Days in Australia. Okay. Naomi was really great at leveraging PR and the Vivid Vision concept. She's now a, a shark on the Shark Tank or Dragon's Den. Indeed, um, and Kendra then another also in, in Shark Tank. She's a guest in Shark Tank in the US. Is she? Yeah. But yeah. So Kendra's Kendra's fantastic. And then another, I, I wish I could remember his name, but he, Sergey um, from Russia. He was from Moscow landed a print article in the Forbes magazine in Russia just by contacting a writer and saying, hey, I have a good story for you. And um, you know, th there's so many, there's so many, uh, so many opportunities, so many press stories out there. Awesome. And just to close the, the interview, what do you think is going to be the three main challenges we're going to leave as CEO, CEOs in the next couple of years? Um, the world's changing a lot. Mm -hmm. We're kind of trying to come back after COVID and redefining yeah. the rules of operation. What do you think are the top three challenges uh, that we're having and how can we continue to provide 10 times more impact in our market i think i think the top the, the top three the first one is focus you know we have so many ideas coming at us from so many different directions that sound good and sound off but if we if we keep going in these different directions we're we're we're, we're hurting our team and our focus so first is focus the second would be about building the hybrid organization and realizing that we can't have everyone come back to an office every day it will never work it will never scale so how do you build a strong culture with a partially remote team, partially hybrid offices? That'll be the second. And then the third is, is really understanding and how to leverage automation and technology so that we can get more done with less people faster so that we can scale leveraging technology instead of hiring more bodies and throwing more people at it. I think that's going to be the third probably opportunity that entrepreneurs have. All right. Uh, Cameron, as always, a uh, pleasure. Uh, great to connect. Um, love your ideas. We use uh, PR a lot. Uh, we've used a lot of your operation, head of operation thing, also at the course that we have at the Growth Institute. Um, and we really believe both of them help significantly have more impact and reduce the drama. You, you get it right. Uh, so you help a lot of entrepreneurs and thank you for that. You're welcome, Daniel. I'll tell you, if, if any of your listeners want to check out the course, if we give them a promo code, uh, Cameron H10, That'll give them 10% yeah. off the invest in your leaders course. So it's Cameron H10. And that for all of your listeners, they can use that code. That's great. Thank you, Cameron. Okay. Thanks. And enjoy your trip in Israel. Have fun. Thank you. Thanks, Daniel. Take it's care. It's pretty late for you, right? It's already... I'm... Yeah, it's uh, 530 here. Ah, not that bad. All right. Have a good one. Thank you, sir. Have a good one. Okay, bye-bye.